So, um, John, thanks for, for sitting down today. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, your, your personal life, and uh, why are you here in the, the 23rd District right now? Uh, what, what brought you here? Well, what brought me here was I did, I, I did a role uh, as an actor. I've been an actor for about four decades, 45 years, and I've been an activist for about 55 years. I think I started when I was 16. How old are you, Austin? Sixteen. All right. All right. <laughs> That's when I started. So anyway, I was um, I was doing a show uh, Inherit the Wind at uh, Jiva Theater in Rochester. Mm -hmm. Played the Clarence Darrow role, which is one of the best roles I've ever got to play. And um, some people came up from Cornell to see the show because they were going to do it the next year. And they saw it and they said, and uh, Beth Millis uh, was the director of the show next year, the following year. And she said, would you mind coming down to uh, Ithaca and do uh, Cornell and do that for me? And I said, well, let me think about it. It's the best role I've ever had. Yes, I would like to. Yeah. So I came to Cornell, and um, I found out they had an RPTA program, Resident Professional Teaching Artist, I think it was called. And uh, I said, can I, would, can I read for that? Can I you know, interview for that, that kind of position? They said, sure. So I became an RPTA. And I was here for uh, four years at that point, and then uh, I bought this house, uh, this old farmhouse, to uh, fix it up, and um, thinking I'd be at Cornell for a period of time. And that's when the whole Bernie Madoff thing hit the fan, and uh, they lost a lot of money. Cornell lost endowment, was my understanding. Nobody counseled me on it. Uh, but, uh, and they, they eliminated that program. Uh, uh, the size of the program, they cut back on it immensely. And uh, so they didn't need me anymore, but I'd already bought this house, and I said, you know what, I would, this is about the prettiest place I've ever seen. So um, this area of the Finger Lakes, so I said, because I lived in California for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, that's how I ended up here, and uh, and my, my daughter, uh, I wanted to. I, I really wanted to get her out of Los Angeles. I, I don't think. No offense to Los Angeles, but it's. I'm more of a small town person, you know. I, I just. Mm -hmm. It just. It was. There was no real there. There here. There's a there everywhere. Yeah. I'd like to write that sentence down. See with that. <laughs> there's no there there here. There's a there everywhere. I, anyway. Uh, sounds like it sounds like yeah. Mr. Twain might have written that and not <laughs> been co totally confused by the time he gets to the end of it. Um, so anyway, that's how I got here. That's what I'm doing here. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have a family. You mentioned your daughter uh, just graduated from Trumansburg, right? Thursday. On Thursday. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> four days ago. Just graduated. And uh, yeah, and we had a lot of house guests here. There was a lot of people here. We had no hot water because my hot uh, water heater went out. Uh, my um, then the chimney gave me problems, so I had no draft, and the uh, monoxide warning light, warning siren went off. I said, "Oh man!" And this was two days before they were arriving. So it's a fun weekend. It was. <laughs> it, I, I I thought what I said was I said you know, it'll be memorable <laughs> for the people that were here with no hot water, and they had to take ice cold showers, uh, but you know. That we got through it, mm -hmm. and everybody seemed to be in good spirits. But uh, yeah, she just graduated from T. Berg. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, you do have a little bit of a background in public service, though, right? With uh, Ulysses. Oh yeah, I'm on the Ulysses Town Board. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 2013. Uh, I, I I think I was I was filling in. I think for. Mr. Romer, I believe. I'm not sure, but. Uh, they they had to uh, they had to uh, resign their board seat because they had s something else going on and I so w they were, people were looking for some some people to run and I said well if nobody else will stand up or you know throw their hat in the ring I'll I'll do it I'm not I'm not crazy about you know I don't have any burning desire to be in the town council but I said I'd, so yeah and it, what I learned was um, what I've learned in four years thus far. Um, is things move a lot more slowly than I could ever have expected because I think it's mainly because the legalities of everything have to be so carefully monitored 
nothing goes fast. Mm -hmm. And from the outside, it's easy to criticize and say, what the heck are you people doing? Why don't we move forward? You know? Yeah. But it's, you know, dealing with the trihalomethane problem in Jacksonville has taken us, it was, it, it was a direct result of the ExxonMobil gas spill in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. There it is. There's the, <laughs> there's the, um, yeah. Um, that's taken us a long time. We're just about at the end of that, but mm -hmm. it's taken us like two or three years yeah. to solve it. So what brought you from Ulysses Town Board and everything else in your, your lengthy, the lengthy history to 2017, 2018, you want to run for Congress? How does that I, I You know, I said, <laughs> what, I, what I have in my little elevator speech is, you know, why am I running for Congress? Why not me? You know, I'm 67. Um, I've been around enough, so I know a lot of things. You get one of the best things about age is that you, you have a perspective. You've lived a number of years, and you've seen all the good things and all the not so good things over a period of years. And uh, you say maybe we could do what happened back in 19, you know, 78. Uh, and people normally, you know, Austin's age would have no idea what I'm talking about, but um, but that that's the good thing about it. Um, why am I running? Is because I said, who else is going? Who is going to be better at this than me? I don't know. Uh, I don't know who's going to be better at this than me. So why not? Why don't I just go ahead and try? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I know what I believe in, and uh, I'm familiar with the issues of this area um now our area expanded the district expanded substantially mm -hmm. in 2010 i would say it was gerrymandered but i uh, i'm not sure about that it was just a lot of western uh area was ex was uh was added on to the district yeah so so for you what, what are the requirements of a congressman a, a kind of simple question that might have a not so simple answer for you what do you mean? What are the requirements? Age requirements? I think I'd make that. <laughs> uh, residency requirements? I'm not sure. For a Senate, I think you have to have seven years residency. Yeah. Well, say, what makes you, what makes a good congressman, in, in your, your opinion? Just telling the truth to the people. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's all about. you gotta believe. You got to believe something and convince the people, the citizens, the constituency that you do believe in something and that you can make a difference on those somethings mm -hmm. uh, for their benefit. Um, and then you, then you have to do it. And it's, um, I don't, I'm not, in terms of private, uh, secret agendas or political ploys, that's not me. I don't know how to do any of that. Mm -hmm. And if that's what it takes, I, I will fail miserably. Um, I don't think that's what it takes. I don't think that's what the founders had in mind. They, they had in mind getting people, uh, uh, ele being elected by the people to represent their needs, to, to represent their uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's what they're out there. That's what, that's what the representatives are there for, mm -hmm. um, I think. And um, uh, there's many things that I... That I uh, I mean, I completely disagree with Tom Reed on just about everything. Um, I, 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 what I don't, what I don't want to be is a quote unquote politician. I don't want to seem like I'm on both sides of every issue. I don't want to end up saying, yeah, you know, I voted this way, but I really, really wanted, I really believe, I really had felt sorry for, and I really wanted to be on this. I, I understand, mm -hmm. you know, so he ends up. And the great politicians do, they end up being on both sides of every issue and you can't really catch them up on anything. Well, mm -hmm. listen, I, I'm going to say what I believe and I'll let the chips fall where they may. If, if people, if that can't get me uh, elected, so be it, you know. It, mm -hmm. But my, I'm going to try to work for, as I say in the, uh, my, some of my material, I'm going to work for the, uh, the workers, the mm -hmm. uh, I'm very middle, I'm, I'm really middle class. Yeah. My dad was in the Air Force, my mother was a high school teacher, and we never had much uh, of anything. But, but 
uh, it didn't matter. You know, it, it was easier uh, maybe back in the day to have the, the middle class was huge mm -hmm. when I was young. It's shrunk considerably now. Yeah. Anyway, I don't going off subject, but so I wanted to get into uh, some policy stuff. We're yeah. just gonna knock out yeah. issue by issue here and just uh, go, just going through. Sometimes I might not have an idea of uh, about that particular issue, but yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Right. Uh, so to start off, for uh, the environment, um, first of all, does climate change exist? And if so, uh, what do you think are the best ways? Um, that you in the House would be able to implement to uh, combat climate change? Well, I, does it exist? It is absolutely exist. There's, there's not a doubt in my one tiny sector of my brain, there's no doubt. Um, 20 years ago, the Dutch, who are the best engineers, I think, in the world, um, started moving their villages and towns away from the seacoast of the Baltic Sea. To get, and the, to get away from, because they knew the water was rising 20 years ago. And, and you know, to ignore the fact that uh, we're having these storms, this violent weather. We've had more rain. Last year it was a complete drought here. Now we've had more rain in, what, six months than we have in years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the volatility of the weather is some proof of global warming. The increase in the mean temperatures of the of the oceans is proof of global warming. Mm -hmm. And do I think the uh, that I, do I think that uh, carbon dioxide in the in the air? Yeah, I think it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it absolutely. Uh, if not the only cause, it is the most exacerbating cause. I believe we've got to get off fossil fuels. We've got to get off them. And in my opinion, we need a. Um, when I was when I was ten years old, it was 1960. Yeah. Uh, Kennedy said, "We're going to the moon as fast as possible." In nine years, we went to the moon from nothing, from the Mercury program, where we were sending a guy, Alan Shepard, up to you know up about what 12, 15 miles, and then back down or whatever it was. I'm not sure how, how far it was. From there to get to the moon and back several times, uh, in by in nine years. When I hear people talk about not being able to switch over, not being able to switch over to alternative energies, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, hydro, uh, tidal for that matter, we have a big coastline, mm -hmm. um, in 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, I said, that's insanity. Yeah. We, did, we went to the moon in nine years. Mm -hmm. We have to do it because we had the political will to do it. Mm -hmm. We need that again. All right. Another issue. Yeah. Second Amendment. Um, guns. Where on the spectrum do you fall from uh, nobody should need to carry a gun to everybody should be open carry? Oh, everybody <laughs> should be open carry. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know about the Wild West, about everybody open carrying a sidearm. It always makes me a little nervous whenever there's, a, whenever there's somebody with a, a gun or a Glock or something on his hip. I, it makes me just a little edgy. Uh, if I'm at, uh, you know, McDonald's or if I'm at a restaurant or something, I got to say, given that, the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment right after the First Amendment. So evidently, the protection of the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association was the founders thought maybe we have to be able to defend all those things. So they put in the Second Amendment. So I absolutely 100% believe in the Second Amendment in terms of the right to bear arms. Mm -hmm. We have, the, the Bill of Rights is about rights. The Second Amendment is about the right to bear arms. It doesn't mean we can bear a tank. It doesn't mean we can bear a rocket launcher. It doesn't mean we can bear, you know, every arm known to mankind. But mm -hmm. we have a right to bear arms. And I think in terms of what arms we can bear, I think that'll be left up to the judiciary uh, to decide. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the economy, a macro sense, uh, not trying to get into nitty gritty details, uh, there's been a lot of talk over the last, uh, ever since the financial crisis really, of how to proceed on the world stage with globalization, 
and a lot of global economic issues. Um, for looking at the district as it is, what do you think are some good macro sense economic price? Oh, you all right? Oh, I felt I, I, I tripped over a guy's roller bag in an airport the other day, and I, I hit. I hit that granite floor hard with my left shoulder. Oh, I just geez. got it in the wrong shoulder. So that would, anyway, macro um, macroeconomic issues to solve in Washington that would have a positive impact on the district. Well, I, you know, I, I, I just heard today about Carrier. Trump made a big, a big uh, sound about saving a thousand jobs at the Carrier plant in Indianapolis. When he came into office, he was, uh, you know, this is what I've done. I just heard today that, like, mm, there, about 700 of those jobs are going to Mexico no matter what. You know, I'm a, I've been a member of a, three unions. Uh, so I'm a, I believe in unions. I believe unions built this middle class and built this country in the 1950s and 60s, right after World War II. Um, and people fought for the right to unionize in the 30s. It was violent in the 20s and 30s. And I, I strongly support several odd, that might sound opposite, but unions. I support living wages. I support um, the, I, I, I think I do, uh, not being a macro econo ec economist, I'm not sure that tariffs or protectionism is the way to go, but I think maybe it is. Every other country, industrialized country and whatnot, manufacturing country, adds, has a VAT tax, mm -hmm. value-added tax. Uh, so they, they tend to protect their industries. Germany has some of the strongest unions in, uh, in the world. Their, uh, you know, their base pay is very livable and yet they are able to produce products that sell all around the world mm -hmm. so what happened to that in america what did we do mm -hmm. i would st i'd have to i guess i'd have to study the macroeconomics of it but i i am so tired of losing jobs uh because people want to be paid a decent wage to send jobs over to jakarta send jobs over to uh the emerging world that where people are forced in often in uh, dictatorial countries to work at wages that are incredibly low, uh, and it saves big business considerable amount. If you can get the the most the perfect way is to have slavery, so you don't have to pay people anything. Well, that's what. Uh, that's what they're, they're not slavery over there in the, in the emerging world, but they're, they're, you know, they're working for 50 cents, 60 cents an hour or a day. Um, it's not right. And that's where, you know, it's just a matter, in my opinion, it's greed. And I don't expect any support from, from any corporate entity or big business because I believe we have to bring the jobs back here. So people say the jobs aren't coming back. Mm -hmm. Well, in my opinion, that's BS. There's a lot of people that want to do those jobs here in this country, and um, we need to bring them back. I, I just, um, it, it irritates the hell out of me when people give up and uh, sell out, yeah. you know. So another topic, uh, immigration, and it kind of falls along those lines as well. The 23rd District is a very large agricultural district. Yeah. Um, the dairy industry, uh, fruits, vineyards, uh, the grapes, um, a lot of those, at least 50% of that labor is migrant labor. Is that right? Mm -hmm. From where? Um, a lot, most of it is from uh, Guatemala and Mexico. Really? About 70% Mexico, 30% wow. Guatemala. Um, well, they're sort of a hidden entity because I never, I mean, I used to live in Southern California mm -hmm. and I worked with a lot of uh, migrant workers. Um, I don't see them here. I see maybe one uh, Central American every month. You know, I around here, I just... So they're sort of hidden. Mm -hmm. I guess it's sort of a hidden yeah, population. It, it, it's a very... And it, it ties into the whole uh, 
a very large issue with uh, immigration migrant workers. Right. Looking at that um, from an immigration perspective, as well as agriculture, since they make up a large portion of that workforce, yeah. to you, what are some practical immigration policies uh, that might be reformed or implemented at, um, in Congress that would help these folks out? Well, I wouldn't vote for the wall right off the bat. That's, uh, that's an unbelievably, uh, it's like a medieval uh, answer to uh, a modern economics question. Um, I, to tell you the truth, I would really have to study that because as a union person, I know that uh, there's a problem, there's a, a headbutting that goes on between migrant workers and union workers. And I, I do believe that, that, um, uh, that in many cases, unions are, 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 uh, are, can be devastated by low-paid migrant workers. But one of the reasons they're low paid is because they're, uh, in so many cases, they're uh, in the shadows. I, I guess I'd have to agree with Obama's um, approaches, um, is get them, uh, get people out of the shadows and give them a pathway to citizenship. Because the people that I've known, that I've worked with, are, are wonderful people. And um, uh, I, I understand. I understand it from both sides. This is one issue that's tough for me because uh, being a union worker, um, I don't like to see the jobs that I do at a union scale be done by people because they're in the shadows for a lot less and they can't complain. Mm -hmm. um, I empathize absolutely with people tr just trying to earn a living and get and provide for their family. Um, Honestly, that would take some study on my part to figure out. We haven't figured it out as a country for 40 or 50 years. And I don't have an answer that even satisfies me at this point. Mm -hmm. All right. Looking at education. Um, we sit here with, with Mark Twain, uh, literature on the table. Um, but as education goes, there's a major discussion right now, almost again from a macro sense, not necessarily a specific topic, but almost whether to invest more money in uh, public school infrastructure or more money in the system in general, or to try new things, such as charter schools. What, in your opinion, um, is a way forward for that system? And um, it, what is the best uh, way to reform the schools, which I think most people would agree are, are struggling? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think Ithaca, where do you go? Ithaca uh, High ACS. School? ACS. Oh, ACS. It's and that's, it's, it's a public school. Yeah. And Ithaca's a public school. And it's Trumansburg, where my, my daughter just graduates, uh, graduated, is a public school. My mother was a high school teacher, French and Latin. Uh, I went to public, I, my sisters and I, we all went to public schools all over the country because we were, in, my dad was in the Air Force, we traveled all over the world. But, um... I really, uh, I, I, I would fight in, on the floor of the house to build public, public education. I think Jefferson had it right. The, the backbone of democracy is an educated electorate. And uh, that's why he basically included public education in his drafts of the Constitution, of his, uh, his concepts for the, uh, the I think, I don't know if the Federalist Papers did it as well, but public education was uh, was a basic um, tenet of Jefferson, and I think he was right. Um, and my mother, being a public school teacher for you know twenty, thirty years, and my two sisters. One sister was in special education for twenty five years. My other sister is a lawyer. She also taught uh, English as a second language. Um, I, 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 I would stand against Betsy DeVos and the uh, charterization of schools, uh, I believe, in a major way. I don't want to have a closed mind towards charters, but I remember um, I, I, public schools served me, <laughs> as, and I realize I'm an old guy, incredibly well. Three people that I think we need to pay more 
We need to pay our teachers a living wage. Hannah had fabulous teachers at, at Trumansburg. Not enough of them, uh, because they, 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 the school budget is just bare bones. But um, we, uh, teachers need to be paid more, nurses need to be paid more, and police officers need to be paid more. I would, I would absolutely, because they have, the teachers have our children for eight, for uh, what, 17, 14 years anyway, 13 years. And we, we try to undercut that, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, nurses, I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital, but the nurses are very important people. They keep you alive, uh, and so do the police. And um, I just think it would improve all the levels if we could find a way to, d to get funds into those three occupations. And if it means paying a little bit more in taxes, so be it. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'm very, on the board, I'm very leery of raising, of adding services because I say it's, it's hard for me to pay my taxes. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to spend the taxpayers' money willy-nilly. I'm very, I'm very cheap, I think, in terms of not, you know, uh, not voting for things that I think are unnecessary. But mm -hmm. public education, in my opinion, is very necessary. And uh, it's done well by me. If I didn't have Latin, I would never have been cast in Star Trek. And that's another story. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you did mention nurses and health care there for a little bit. Yeah. Which, um, that's the, the big debate of the day right now, this week especially, uh, as uh, the Republicans look to move the AHCA um, on the yeah. president's desk. But um, looking at this, if uh, you would end up in Washington in 2018, assuming that... Um, the Affordable, uh, the Affordable Care Act, in some way, was replaced with some sort of uh, American Health Care Act, some sort of GOP. What to you would be um, some top priorities, smaller things, uh, perhaps part of the uh, HCA or uh, the ACA that you would like to implement or see on the record um, that you could implement separately? I don't understand what the Medicaid expansion is exactly, but I, I, I get the, it's, generally speaking, the states that refused to go along with uh, Obamacare, ACA, uh, withheld their commitment of Medicaid funds towards the program, and so um, premiums were not subsidized. and continued to go up. Um, I was on the ACA for a year before I turned 65 uh, and I could get Medicare. Medicare is the most efficient, most successful health insurance program in the United States and it is single payer. Mm -hmm. It is, Medicare is single payer. Please understand that. That 37 other industrialized democracies and countries in this world have a single-payer program of some sort. Why America doesn't do it is simple. Profits. We have, you got to ask yourself, why are the tallest buildings in city centers usually crowned with, this, with the name of an insurance company? You know, so many of them are. If it's not a Trump hotel, it's an insurance company or a bank because of the profit involved. Mm -hmm. And when we have a single-payer program that not only is solvent, despite what Republicans want to keep saying, it's, it's, uh, it's all, it, basically they're lying, um, Medicare is uh, solvent, Medicare will be solvent, and it's everybody... The, the first words of the Constitution... We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, well, it doesn't say we the people in order to form a more perfect individualized place where people don't care about each other. It says a more perfect union. Mm -hmm. We're living in a society for a reason. It, we're not all. We're not 
I mean, yes, rugged individualism is fine, but when you live in a society, you're going to bump elbows with everybody else in that society. And you have to be, you, you have to be aware that certain people are going to need help, those people won't need help. Uh, and as a group, we can help everybody appropriately, I think. That's, so I'm, I am, despite what um, Mr. Reed says, I'm a single payer advocate. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to get away from the issues a little bit and right. move back towards you. <laughs> All right. Um, so, to clarify something here, are you seeking uh, the Democratic nomination or are you um, currently going for as an independent candidate? Oh, no, if I can get the Democratic nomination, I'll, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a Democrat all my life. I was an independent uh, for a while, I think, when Jack Anderson was running. And I the first person I canvassed for was George McGovern in uh, 1972 or 3. It mm -hmm. was back in the day. I remember going to uh, Polish neighborhoods in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, Sawyersville, an area, where people actually did not speak English. Uh, in mining, little mining towns, yep. and I was, t you know about it, mm -hmm. you're from Reading, um, and I would talk to them about the bombardment of Cambodia, and, you know, in a language they didn't really understand, mm -hmm. and I was, but I was uh, doing my best for, uh, for my govern, as opposed to uh, Nixon. Um, I, you know, I, um, Uh, I, I, it's my, uh, uh, my take on, on that aspect of, is, uh, it just, it sort of wells up inside of me and completely wipes out everything else. What was the aspect, again, that you wanted to know about? I just wanted to know if you were lo looking for the Democratic nomination. <laughs> yeah, um... So, so yes, you are seeking... I am... ...running in the primary. I am... And, but if I don't get it, I, I intend to stay in the race. As an independent? As an independent, as a write-in, if, if that's what it takes. Um, yeah, I, um, I have... Uh, I, as long as the Democratic Party is fighting for the little guy, I'm there. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Yeah. Do you worry about that if... Uh, under what circumstances... Would you run as an independent, and do you think that could harm um, a Democrat's chance? I th because I think I have a better chance than any other Democrat in the race, mm -hmm. and I don't unless uh, unless uh, oh who who could it be unless another Cuomo turns up uh, you know in in Tompkins County or in in Chautauqua or somewhere, um, I think I have a better chance to 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 defeat any other. Um, any Republican, I think I have a better. It, it's not going to be. It's not going to be easy because the, the Republican uh, uh, majority in this district is sizable, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I have to be able to get uh, some moderate Republicans to come out to my side, and that that. <coughs> how how would you do that? That's where Mark Twain comes in. Yes, Mark, explain explain Mark <laughs> Twain. Mark Twain here. Mark Twain had the unusual ability. To criticize people, I mean, he would say things like, um, uh, you know, a congressman and a diaper is, uh, they're, they're pretty much the same. They, they need to be changed frequently and for the same reason. And so the man could criticize Congress and call them, they're full of you know what, but he did it with humor. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hope to... Uh, be able to uh, discuss my issues and criticize the opposition to those issues uh, in such a way as not to not to make enemies. But if I can do it with humor, if I can do it with uh, humanity in my heart for the for for the other person on the other side of the issue, um, then I think uh, I think I'll be all right. And th because that's what Mark Twain did. He was able to uh, destroy. <laughs> You know, the opposition um, with a, just a few words and, and still make them his friend. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Twain represents one of the great parts of the American ethos. You know, we're Americans first. We're not Republicans or Democrats or uh, whatever. Uh, we're Americans. And 
he was unique. He was perhaps the embodiment of what American is. Um, and for that reason, I, I want to try to make him my spokesman at times, utilizing what I've spent 45 years doing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get somebody else to do it. I can do it. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's why Mark... Uh, so your philosophy is that humor would, uh, would be able to build the bridge between... That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. what, With what humor, it's hard to attack people when, they, when you're laughing. Yeah. It's hard to... Laughter is the best medicine. Laughter is the best medicine. And, yeah, and uh, what about smile <laughs> when the world is hating you. What about some, some fairly polarizing issues? Like, health care is a, a very polarizing issue right now. Do, when is it? Do you think it's going to be easy, or do you uh, expect difficulty in looking somebody who's on the other side in the face, who may be able not be able to afford uh, their premiums right now? You know what I. You know what I plan on doing. I plan on if, if when I when I go to the little towns when I, you know out west that that don't know they don't know me from Adam. Um, I want to be able to talk to people and say, all right, tell me exactly what the problem is. I don't want to hear a Republican talking point. I don't want to hear a Democratic talking point. Mm -hmm. I want to hear, okay, tell me what your particular problem is. And then with the, with the general and hopefully more in-depth knowledge that I have gained at that point, I can respond knowledgeably and uh, hopefully bend them around to understanding that single payer <laughs> Is a, is a response that will take care of that problem. Um, I want to get the specific questions from the people so that I can respond specifically and not just try to cookie cutter a, 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 uh, a partisan response. Because that, that, that's, wh that's why we're in the mix, you know, the, 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 the uh, terrible situation that we're in. People don't listen to each other. I want to hear what the problem is, because if you hear what the problem is, and if you listen to what the problem is, I, I believe people can come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never run across it where that you couldn't. I've never come up. I've never come up against insoluble problems. Uh, I, anyway, mm -hmm. they're tough, but they're not insoluble. Mm -hmm. All right. One last question, and uh, this is what I've been ending on for, for all the candidates that I've been uh -oh. to. Sounds like a biggie. It's, it's the doozy. Um, Do you know what the doozy is from? Uh-oh. you know what the word doozy is <laughs> from? Enlighten me. It's the Duesenberg. was the biggest, nicest car on the road was a Duesenberg, and they called him a doozy. And that's, that's why the doozy is a big issue. <laughs> that's true. Well, I hope and it's you not can, an issue. As, as Casey question. Stengel said, you can look it up. Anyway. All right. Um... So, again, posing this to each candidate. Yeah. Should you, uh, we discussed the primary earlier, but should you lose the primary or the general? Um, is there something? <laughs> I'm the pessimist. I'm from yes. southern Pennsylvania. I have the, the, the PA Dutch roots here. Okay. Well, I'm Amish. Pessimist. Hertzler's an Amish name, so you tell me about the Dutch, <laughs> the Pennsylvania Deutsch. If you ain't, if you ain't PA Dutch, you ain't much. <laughs> That's right. Throw me That's over. What we say. That's and right. Throw me over the fence some hay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, should you not? to Mika Funga, yeah, Vinci Hogan Bluffin, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> now, now you're out there. I'm a little bit of Welsh boy too. Oh, Welsh! Don't go oh, there. nice. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> um, should you lose? Is there something you want to leave behind in your race that they remind remember? Oh yeah, that's the thing John Hertzer said. When this comes around, as time will go on. If this comes around in 2020, or people say, that's the thing John Hertzler started in 2018. In 2020? You know, Reagan took the solar panels off the White House that Jimmy Carter had put on. Jimmy Carter had set up a solar energy policy that would have had us completely off of any dependence upon foreign oil by the year 2000. Reagan stopped every policy that he had set up, and, and it was visibly the symbolic, the symbolism of taking the, 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 uh, the solar panels off the White House 
was significant of that uh, of that argument saying no no let's burn the fossil fuels this is America um, but just think how many lives would have been saved in the Middle East just think how many American lives would have been saved how many times we didn't have to invade to protect our oil interests um, just think of that so that's one thing um, climate change if I, I believe I am so correct about believing 99.9% .9 of the scientists that climate change is real, it's happening, and it's, um, it's uh, uh, spiraling geometrically out of control. We have to set up a program to deal with it. We cannot do it as an afterthought because if we lose that battle of climate change, the human race loses big time. Mm -hmm. Or as Trump would say, bigly. That's Sherwood Forest. That's my. Uh, <laughs> um, the second thing is, uh, the first thing was climate change. The second thing is health care. Mm -hmm. I'm right about single payer. I have no doubt in my mind about it. I have to stop my phone. Uh, I'm right about single payer. And hopefully by, by 2020, 2022, whatever it takes, mm -hmm. people will understand that that's right. That's the way for us to go. Everybody will be taken care of. There's not going to be 24 million people thrown off. The, 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 the premiums won't be out of control. The insurance companies will be brought back down to size. That's my hope. All right. That's all I have. Well, thank you so much for sitting right, down and doing this today. Thank you.